This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 265, recorded on May 12, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Great to be here. I got the location right. You sure do. Okay. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. And I, of course, am coming to you from New York City in the incubator, our recording studio. All right. And, uh, I was in I was in Omaha yesterday. It was ninety two degrees. Ooh. <laughs> Omaha, are you back on the road, Vincent? Yes, that was my first trip since March twenty twenty. Two years, roughly. And now I'm every month I'm going somewhere. And the airports are full. Right, airports now are full because it's time for students to go home, right? Yes. Um, And people going on vacation and so forth. And so I have a busy schedule. But here in New York, it's only, it's 20 degrees. It's 68. Very different uh, than Omaha. It's coming your way. It was, it's going to be 80 here today in Ann Arbor. 80 here. So in in, uh, in the microbiology department there, it's mainly bacteria research. They have a lot of staphylococci people. They have chlamydia, intracellular bacteria. Only one virology lab. How about that? Hmm. Were you at the med school or are you I was at, at the medical school? Yeah. Yeah. I had the privilege of speaking to them in December of 2019 before the great wall of COVID came down on us all. Yeah. It was very nice. The students, of course, invited me and uh, they're, they're TWIV fans. And so they were happy to have me go. And I had a great time. Uh, so, and then, in fact, some of the students have started their own podcast where they yes. interview faculty and uh, they interviewed me. And that's great. I'm, I'm really happy to see them doing that. All right. Today we have for you a snippet uh, and a paper. And I will do the snippet. And as I am want to do, I usually pick something to do with viruses. Not always, but mostly. And this is a uh, twim. So I pick bacteriophages. And this is a cell host and microbe paper entitled Phages and Their Satellites Encode Hotspots of Antiviral Systems. This comes from the University of Paris and the Weizmann Institute in Israel. First author is Francois Rousset, and uh, Rousset, as well as uh, David Bicard, uh, are the two corresponding authors. And a satellite, what is a satellite? Well, we're going to let you know what that is, because I like satellites, because they occur in... uh, eukaryotic viruses as well. Now, as everyone must know, bacteria have defenses against bacteriophage infection. And it's as the more it's studied, the more complex it becomes and involved. And there are multiple mechanisms by which bacteria combat phage infection, including restriction of DNA, where the incoming DNA of the phage, if it's not modified in a certain way, it's cut by restriction enzymes, abortive infection, chemical interference, nucleotide depletion are some of the mechanisms. And the neat thing is the genes encoding these, the proteins that participate in these systems tend to cluster in in particular places in the genome that are called defense islands. It's a nice word, right? A defense island. And so often you can just look around these defense islands and find new defense systems. And there's as the authors say, there are many more likely to be discovered. Other studies of uh, defenses uh, of bacteria against phage have revealed mobile genetic elements that uh, carry antiphage functions, and they can move from bacterium to bacterium. Uh, another one is uh, temperate phages, which are known to uh, also have uh, antiphage functions. Now you're thinking, what is that? That's wait a minute. You're talking about bacterial antiphage. Well, lysogeny, phage survival is tied to that of the host, right? And so often these these lysogens have genes called moron genes 
that enhance <laughs> the fitness of their host, but they're not needed for survival because the phage benefits from survival of the host, obviously. And uh, that is what actually <laughs> drove me crazy when we were doing phage therapy as a research project because uh, we didn't know about the moron operons uh -huh. that are affiliated with these phages. And, you know, many bacteria that you think phage therapy would be appropriate for mm -hmm. because they're already lysogenized and these genes are being expressed, as you're going to tell us. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. They already lysogenized, yeah. And the, 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 what the consequence is your phage therapy won't work. And that was the evolution of our approach of how we went against the dogma of using exponential expansion of replicating phage to wipe out an infection. Mm -hmm. What we approached it by is that the bacterium would inject a lethal agent or the phage would inject a lethal agent and that would effectively knock out any of the, what I referred to at the time, the virulence determinants of the phage that were lysogenized that prevented uh, yeah. phage therapy from working. And I think, you know, I, I heard a grand rounds last week that, um, you know, infectious disease physicians are beginning to actively explore phage therapy again. And I think this, this is a paper that they all need to read yeah. because it will actually teach them a lot about the limitations mm -hmm. of phage therapy before they get too deep into it. Now, on the other hand, phages also fight back. They oh, yes. Have, they have anti-defense strategies that counter the bacterial ones. Uh, they, you know, they, the phage genomes are smaller than bacterial genomes. So uh, they are somewhat limited in number, uh, in the number of systems. But uh, they do have uh, a number of systems, and that's what this paper explores today. And in particular, this paper, small but mighty, this paper explores satellites. So satellites are viruses that are defective and depend on a ho on a helper virus. Uh, and in this case today, we're going to talk about satellites that require the capsid protein of the helper in order to be packaged and propagate. And sometimes these satellites also inhibit the reproduction of the helper. Uh, besides taking their capsid gene, they inhibit their reproduction. And um, they they note in their in their introduction that um, whether there are defensive systems uh, against other phages besides the helpers has not been really uh, looked at. And so that's what they're going to look at in this paper. They're going to look at there's the the system of of P2 and P4 satellite phages and what kind of defensive systems uh, are there and how the defense system of one phage interacts with another phage. So you know that the idea is it's very simple. If you are dependent on a helper you don't particularly want to block it from infecting the cell, right? So how do you deal with that? All right, so this starts with them uh, identifying a reverse transcriptase uh, in, a, in a particular gene in E. coli. Um, and uh, these reverse transcriptase have been implicated in anti-defense system. So they looked around the RT gene and um, th they found that this reverse transcriptase was inserted into a P4-like phage satellite. And these are very common in enterobacteria. So they looked in other E. coli strains, and they found that, in fact, each P4-like element had a different genetic system uh, at the same locus. So not the same as the RT system, but something different. And these looked like they had uh, both uncharacterized proteins as well as known defense proteins in them. Nice. So associated with this P4 like satellite, right? So they're basically mining the genome sequences and they found 5,200 occurrences of a particular locus of defense in over 20,000 E. coli genomes wow. that they looked through. And the genes, they say, fall into three categories, known defense systems, uncharacterized systems with proteins that look like they're associated with bacterial immunity, uh, unannotated proteins, no idea what they do. So then they said, let's see if these genes have antiphage activity. So that's what they're looking for now. They're looking for genes associated with a satellite. It's a lysogen that's a satellite uh, in E. coli. Do they have 
uh, antiphage activity. So they just clone the genes into a vector, introduce them in E. coli, and then infect them. They have a collection of eight coliphages, you know, with many of the common phages there. And the, the control, of course, is just a plasmid, uh, including gene, green fluorescent protein. And they ask a simple question. They ask, does it plaque? Yeah, does it plaque? Very simple. And seven of the system provide resistance to at least one phage. Seven of those eight systems that they that they identify. That's very cool. Um, more than eight, sorry. It's, I think 18 systems. Mm -hmm. And so they have... Uh, they have particular genes that are involved here in, in this defense system that they're going to explore uh, further now. So um, th they do a series of experiments to to study this further, and they conclude that P4, like satellites, have a hotspot in their genome that is a reservoir of antiphage defense systems. So P4 is a phage. It's defective. It's a satellite. Yet it has defense systems against other phages. It's a tough world out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So they look, they focus on a specific system, which they call Paris. And this is because it comprises two proteins, an ATPase and a, and a second protein, uh, which, and they find genes for these in 5% of bacterial and archaeal genomes. Wow. And so two, two, uh, it seems to be two genes. Uh, and uh, they actually find that this has antiphage uh, activity using the same assay for a large range of uh, phages. And they focus on one system from a particular strain of E. coli. So again, they have two genes. They're called REA and REB. Deletion of either one abolishes defense. And one of their ideas is that it's a toxin-antitoxin pair. But this experiment, when they take one or the other out, is not toxic, which you would expect from a toxin-antitoxin pair. And it also abolishes defense. So you need both... Uh, components for activity. Uh, then they do studies with phage T7 to see how these two proteins are working. At low multiplicity of infection of T7 phage, you get partial resistance. But at a high multiplicity of infection, the, the, the phage can infect, but it stops reproducing uh, after a certain amount of time. And you get a reduction in the number of cells uh, that are infected. So they say, it looks like somehow these two proteins induce an abortive infection. And how they do this, they don't know. It's something they want to figure out. All right, so what is the trigger for this system? And so what they do is beautiful, typical, great genetics. They isolate phages that can overcome the system, right? So these two proteins, the Paris system, if you will, can um, limit the, the infection. They showed it for T7. Now they're going to identify... T7 mutants that can overcome it, that can grow in the presence of it. And they find four different T7 mutants that have restored infectivity in the presence of this two-component system. They all have a single amino acid change at amino acid 54 in a very particular gene that encodes an anti-restriction protein. Wow. So restriction systems, restriction modification systems in bacteria can put can a modifier which could modify the DNA so it's not cut by the restriction enzymes. And this gene that is changed in these phages that can overcome the Paris system <laughs> carries an anti-restriction system. And by the way, this protein is called OCR. It's a protein that mimics the structure of DNA. And that's how <laughs> it inhibits these restriction because the restriction modification systems think it's DNA. It's yeah. a decoy, right? It's I just thought that was beautiful. Well, this goes <laughs> to show you that evolution's great asset is time. Oh, yes. Mm. I mean. <laughs> Exquisite we, engineer. This was not an engineered solution. This was, you know, random chance built up over eons. That's mm. right. In fact, so what they've got here, they do some, a number of experiments, which we won't go into. They, they call this a remarkable evolutionary strategy where cells have used a counter-defense protein, this OCR protein, as a trigger for abortive infection. So in other words, you get infected by a phage, and that phage could typically be re restricted by the restriction modification system. But if it overcomes it, then this OCR protein triggers the Paris system, which kills the cell. And so it stops the phage 
once it gets past those initial defenses, which I think is very cool. And so that is uh, all revealed by very straightforward uh, genetics uh, and, and reveals uh, quite a bit. Now, P4, which we've been looking at here, as I said, it's a, it's a satellite that lacks structural genes. It um, takes capsids from the helper phages of the P2 family. P4 and P2 have a packaging signal in common. And they notice that the defense hotspot with these genes that they've been studying is right near the uh, attachment site where the where the phage DNA would integrate into the genome. And so they looked at the genes around it and identify 169 genetic systems comprising different defense proteins. And again, they're just looking at genome sequences around these attachment sites. And they have more potential defense system. They clone eight of these out. They test their activity. They find three that have antiphage activity. So they conclude that both P4 and P2 at these attachment sites have a whole range of genetic diversity that encodes defense against other phages. Wow. Which is incredible. And then the last uh, set of experiments, they want to know, like, how do P4 and P2 deal with each other, right? Because, you know, P4 mm. needs P2 to a certain extent. So you might imagine that they have some kind of understanding, right? <laughs> so it turns out that when fa when a cell is infected by a phage from P2 family, the P4-like satellites package their DNA into those capsids, and then the cell dies. Uh, and so they hypothesize that the defense systems in the P4-like satellites usually will not restrict P2 phages and in fact, that's what they find, as you would guess, because they're they're dependent. P4 is dependent on P2. And so its this defense systems do not impair P2, although they will impair other phages, as we've seen uh, in this paper. And finally, they look to see if such defense hotspots exist in prophages from other bacteria. And of course, yes, they do. <laughs> they're in the Vibrio. They're in Bacillus. And so they're probably, as they say, a significant reservoir of new antiviral systems. They call it a stunning diversity of genetic systems in phages uh, and satellites. And all you have to do is is look uh, and you will find. So uh, th there's a lot more work to be done, clearly. Uh, and uh, they say that the their work challenges the paradigm as the satellite as a phage parasite by showing that in some circumstances, the interactions are mutualistic. P2, P4 says, yeah, P2, you can infect. We need your capsid so you can infect the cell. And so a lot of this all starts by examining metagenomic information, right? So it just shows you how far you can go by just looking at genome sequences, right? There you go. Not only is this biology <laughs> just so beautiful, I am trying to put myself in the place of being the experimentalists who are making each of these discoveries. What an amazing experience that must have been. Of course. Yeah, you, you start by asking a simple question, you start to look, and you and just keep just going, gets right? bigger and deeper, and yeah, you get more and more confident that you're onto something really novel and cool. And many of the experiments are rather straightforward. You produce oh, yeah. the protein out of plasmid, and you see if the phage makes a plaque. It's just great, right? Right. Elegant. And, and Elegant. the paper is approachable from that perspective. I mean, they they have these incredible figures that you can look at to see what they've actually done, where the genes are located, yeah. what's actually going on. So this is not one of these scary papers that you have to be in the field to appreciate because you can actually see what they're doing. And, you know, the way I looked at it at the end, it's this is really reinforcing the old adage of unintended consequences I mean, the phage have anticipated an unintended consequence. Yeah. They, they have a contingency for almost anything. Oh, but that's evolution, as Michelle said, right? Yeah. yeah it's it's not, trial and error. They're not thinking. They're not thinking. It's just trial and error. That's right. And what works mm -hmm. is what we're seeing. Which right? we keep. Or error, trial, it, error, trial. <laughs> error, it's that's error right. and trial. Error and <laughs> trial. Whatever doesn't kill us, we, we, we keep. It's kind of like science, right? We make yes. errors and we try again. <laughs> that's why we call it research and not search. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. Exactly right. So anyway, I found that a really a fun paper.
very accessible. So uh, really if, you're, if you're able to reach it, check it out. All right. Now we're going to hear from Michelle. It's open access. It's open access. So, yeah. And actually, this is another incredibly beautiful and accessible paper showing beautiful genetics, also published in Cell Host and Microbe. And it's entitled Bacterial Hydrophilins Promote Pathogen Desiccation Tolerance. And it is a collaboration between colleagues at the Department of Pathology, Microbiology, and Immunology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and the Department of Chemistry in Indiana. And the authors are Aaron Green, Joseph Fakhury, Andrew Monteith, Hoyling Pai, David Guiderock, and Eric Scar. And it is to be published in July of 2022, but it's available early online, again, in Cell Host Microbe. So they're referring to um, pathogen desiccation tolerance. What pathogen is this? This is a really a nasty bug, Acinetobacter bomani. It is, according to the CDC, an urgent threat because many of these strains are now resistant to many of our antibiotics and even carbon pedum, which is one of our last defenses. So this um, bug, unfortunately, um, can survive on surfaces for a long time. So hospitals are found to have many um, sites where Bomani lives f- for months, and it can, once it gets into the vulnerable population spread by healthcare workers, for example, um, it can cause pneumonia, soft tissue infections, bloodstream infections. So this is a serious um, hospital infection control problem and a public health uh, risk. So um, this lab has decided they are going to take this uh, problem on and they do so with some really uh, elegant genetics and molecular biology. So what they um, first do is realize that they need to set up an assay in the laboratory for the ability to survive on surfaces. So they do a really simple experiment. They take a colony of their Bamani strain, and they just spread it on the bottom of the well of a 24-well polystyrene plate, put the plate dry in the incubator under some humidity, and then days, days, weeks later, they um, add a little buffer to the well bring the bugs into suspension, and then ask, are they alive or dead? And so in the figure 1A of the paper, you can see that um, they're very patient, for example. They take this (laughs) experiment out 250 days. (laughs) But you can see a steady decline in survival, but they're not dying. And in fact, in the next um, figure, what they do is look at, let's see, 1B, they are looking how many weeks later? It's weeks later, and I can't locate it 28 at the moment. Days. 28, 28 days. 28 days, yeah. of days later. <laughs> yeah. um, and they compare their laboratory strain of um, Acinetobacter bomani to a number of well-known uh, hospital uh, plague it, bugs that cause hospital infections, including Klebsiella pneumonia and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And they also compare it to a number of clinical isolates of their um, pathogen of choice. And what you see is that the, um, in fact, this um, Bamani is is the champ. It survives much better than all the other strains they test. So that's yeah, poor um, E. coli. E. coli <laughs> DH five alpha is there in the weeds. It it just drops dead. Like if you look and at we're it, we're talking cross-eyed. logs, like three orders. We're, of we're talking worse. six logs. Yeah, yeah. six <laughs> logs dead. Oh right, those are th- yeah. Th- that's that's yeah. a log scale. That's six logs of dead E. coli. <laughs> and and the clinical strains, um, it's concerning, are actually the champs. They do even better than the lab strain. So. Okay, they survive, but are they still virulent? Let's check. So they rehydrate um, these strains that have been desiccating for periods, and they put them in the nasal passages of mice. And what they find is, uh, yes, not only are they still able to cause infection, but they actually are more fit than their um, strain that didn't was not first subjected to desiccation. So they're actually more infectious, a, better able to um, colonize the lung, the liver, the spleen. Not only that, but they found this desiccation tolerance um, trait is uh, reversible. So if they first do their desiccation on the, on the polystyrene plate and um, rehydrate it, and then culture it in rich media for just a few hours, 
and then to redo the experiment, now they've lost the, t- the tolerance. Hmm. So in other words, this is a reversible phenotype. It's not like they've selected for the rare mutant that, that can um, tolerate desiccation. This is a d- developmentally regulated trait. So now um, they wanted to double check to see if, if it's only they're um, become more tolerant to desiccation or some other um, onslaughts. So they, they th- consider what other stresses that the, um, this pathogen would experience during infection. And a major one is reactive oxygen species. So our white blood cells, neutrophils in particular, they can dump reactive oxygen species onto invading microbes and, and kill them. So they just do a simple experiment in vitro. They um, expose their desiccated uh, Bamani to different doses of hydrogen peroxide. And my goodness, um, they found that after desiccation, the cells are 10,000 times um, more resilient than cells that had not been desiccated. So, And we're talking <laughs> 40 millimolar hydrogen peroxide, yeah. folks. That's a lot of peroxide. The neutrophil so no doesn't. Wonder. The neutrophil's not pumping out forty millimeter, forty micromolar peroxide. And it's no wonder we can't clear it from our hospital surfaces, mm-hmm. right? If it's that tolerant to these stresses. Yeah. So now the hunt is on. Um, they've got some really simple quantitative assays, and they've got a really strong phenotype, orders of magnitude differences. So this is a geneticist's dream. Um, so they now they do a really powerful combination of just classical genetics, simple genetic selection, and they combine it with fast, cheap DNA sequencing and some sophisticated bioinformatic tools to identify um, components in the pathway that equip Bamani to survive this desiccation tolerance. So in particular, what they use is um, a, a technique called TNSeq where you basically construct a whole library of transposon mutants such that most every gene in the genome is is knocked out by a transposon. And then you subject the pools to your selection, in this case, desiccation, and then um, see who survives, culture them, and then sequence out from the transposon to learn where that transposon is sitting. So they do this across the whole genome and then ask any gene or any locus that's missing now from the pool that didn't come through the desiccation must be a component that's important for this resilience trait. So they are able to um, identify by this um, TNSeq approach of many different genes that are contributing. And they are most interested in following up on one, which is a, a well-known, a well-characterized um, a protease, protease called a lawn protease. This is conserved in a number of bacteria, and it's known to degrade proteins that are unfolded or aggregated in response to stress. So they accumulate when cells are subjected to uh, drying or noxious chemicals, et cetera. And what's curious is cells that lack this lawn protease are actually more hardy than the wild type. And they can maintain a viability after a four-week desiccation that is two logs higher than wild type when you knock out this lawn protease. And they also found that um, the lawn protease mutants are more resilient to uh, reactive oxygen species as well. So they want to use this as a tool to try to um, understand this uh, resilience phenotype. So what they do is um, grow up cultures of wild type and the lawn protease, and then just run um, the uh, aggregated proteins out on gels. And what they discover is a really prominent uh, 46 kilodalton band that um, seems very interesting to them because it's much more abundant in the lawn protease um, mutant that's been subjected to desiccation. So here they can turn to uh, really sophisticated proteomics to just quickly sequence that band and deduce uh, what gene it is. And what they find is that it is has an unusual, a couple of unusual features, which is a lot of repeats of small charged hydrophilic amino acids like glycine and serine. And it turns out this is a a trait that's been um, seen before in a class of proteins called hydrophilins. Um, And these are um, proteins that are thought to form almost glass-like shells around either DNA or protein um, to protect them from desiccation. 
And these hydrophilins have been described in a wide range of organisms, including yeast, nematodes, plant seeds, and tardigrades. They're like the champs. Mark Martin, wake up. (laughs) Yeah. So they're also another trait of these proteins is they're what's called intrinsically disordered. That means they can Mm. um, they can uh, assume many different conformations, which probably makes sense if they're going to shield a wide variety of proteins. So they decided to name this protein desiccation tolerant protein A, DTPA, and they wanted to study it further. So as good geneticists, um, they made a mutant in the DTPA gene, and they compared its survival to wild type um, after being subjected to um, desiccation. And they did find that about a log fewer cells um, that lacked DTPA survived compared to wild type. But interestingly, when they looked at the double mutant, so DTPA and the lawn protease double mutant, that strain did even better than wild type. So that told them that there must be additional factors that are contributing. So now, like the authors of the last paper, they've got more uh, where they can dig deeper and, and learn more about this system. So... So while you're looking for that, Michelle, I'd like to point out that the first author, uh, Green, she actually brought some of this transposon mutagenesis capabilities with her when she entered the laboratory at Vanderbilt, Eric Sacker's lab at Vanderbilt. She brought Scar, that techn- Eric Scar. Eric Scar's. She brought that technology with her from Tufts, where she was in the lab of Joan uh, Micaeus. And uh, she worked on uh, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. And it's just absolutely fascinating how what y- you, you don't want to ever forget what you used to do um, because <laughs> it, it really has paid handsome dividends here with um, this whole story with the lawn protease as well as with this new – DTPA uh, protein, which I, when I was reading the paper, thought of it as being artificial water because it's keeping Mm. the proteins hydrated. So they don't, you know, assume this lethal conformation that would wake up the other systems in the cell to Uh. uh, destroy the protein. And I think that's where you're going next. Well, what I was going to do next is say that as um, good geneticists and bacterial geneticists, they realized that as we learned in in the last paper, um, microbes often encode in clusters genes that have functional uh, relationships. So they looked at the locus where this DTPA is encoded, and they were, I'm sure, delighted to find that there were a number of other genes previously characterized in E. coli and other bacteria that are also related to Um, oxidative stress tolerance, for example. For example, um, the CAT-E gene is nearby, and that encodes a catalase that basically detoxifies hydrogen peroxide um, into water and oxygen. So they were interested in uh, looking at what those other unknown proteins are that encode, are encoded in the same locus with DTPA. And sure enough, they find another locus that also, like DTPA, has got um, many of these um, repeats of the hydrophilic charged amino acids. And both DTPA and DTPB are conserved within the um, Bamani complex of bacteria, but are not common in other bacteria that don't display this um, amazing uh, resilience to um, desiccation. They also found that um, mutants that lack DTPB are also um, more resilient than the wild, or I'm sorry, if they lack the DTPB, they are less resilient than wild type to desiccation. So um, that's why it earned the name DTPB. Um, Another uh, line of experiments they did that I won't go into detail is um, another bit of serendipity. They, um, the experimentalists, were looking at their plates, you know, growing colonies, and they found an oddball colony that had a more um, glassy experience, uh, uh, appearance. And 
did whole genome sequencing on that odd colony and identified a two-component regulatory system, which they go on to show in experiments I won't describe, um, is um, important for the regulation and expression of these um, hydrophil and proteins that form this glass-like water protective barrier. So now they want to um, ask whether these two um, genes that they found, these hydrophilins, also are contributing to the amazing resilience to desiccation that they observed in their first um, experiment, looking at their panel of clinical strains. So they um, took one of their clinical strains and they made a um, mutant um, of the DTPA and also the DTP gene. And sure enough, um, they found that those strains lost some of their ability to survive. They also found that one of the clinical strains actually made 2,000 times more RNA for the DTPA mm-hmm. gene and the DTPB gene than their lab strain did. So, my goodness, <laughs> these clinical strains apparently are under a lot of selective pressure for for keeping this desiccation defense strong because they are prepared to really crank it out when they need it. So now, as the cherry on top, um, they asked if the DTPA gene was not just necessary, but also sufficient to confer resilience to desiccation. So to do that, they turned to some in vitro and in vivo experiments uh, with E. coli. So first, um, they did a tried-and-true um, assay uh, with the beta-lactamase um, enzyme. So this is one that um, many geneticists, it's one of the first tools they learn. Um, you can get blue colonies on a beta-gal plate if you've got mm-hmm. beta-lactamase. Um, but they had um, the beta-lactamase enzyme purified, and they could put it in mixtures with different ratios of their purified DTPA protein. And then um, they could subject that mixture to some stresses and then just measure the enzymatic activity for beta-gal assay using a beta, quantitative beta-gal assay. And in fact, they did find that in vitro, um, the DTPA protein was sufficient to protect uh, the beta-lactamase enzyme from desiccation. And it was much better than their control protein, uh, bovine serum albumin, which is known to stabilize proteins and is commonly used uh, for that purpose. They also found that DTPA could protect the beta-gal enzyme from um, heat stress. So again, getting really confident that they've identified some key players. And remember, if you look at your restriction enzymes and look at the makeup of your restriction enzymes, you'll find that most of those enzymes have BSA added to them. Hmm. And that BSA is to protect the activity of those restriction enzymes. And that was discovered when they were be- when New England Biolabs was beginning to mass produce enzymes to sell to molecular biologists. So the BSA up to this point in time has been the gold standard protective protein to keep enzymatic activity available to proteins. But now we got purified DTPA in the wings ready to help us. And the virulence data that they have shown us really drives home the fact that DTPA may be better than the stuff that we get from cows. What is the mechanism <laughs> similar, you think, Michael? I, I don't know how BSA works. I just knew it was always in every enzyme yeah. from New England Biolabs. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we often add it to but, reactions too. Yeah. yeah. But in their quantitative um, data that they show in figure six, DTPA oh, is doing much better than it's um, It's than incredible, BSA. Michelle. I'm sorry I interrupted you as you were no, on the roll. No, please. But no, I, I think it. that's important for for the audience to appreciate because many of us have used restriction enzymes. We've added BSA to reactions and we never have known why. <laughs> and, you know, the environment is not very friendly to enzymatic reactions. And, you know, the the cytoplasm of bacterial cells is pretty damn hostile. Um uh, so these these protective proteins were re- beginning to to get some tremendous insight into how microbes actually are protecting themselves and you know the tardigrades have been using this as well as plants 
you know, they can't move to get water. The tardigrades are out in space just floating around. So God knows. And they have multiple, multiple hydrophilins. Yes, Yes, multiple. Yes. So, so. I'll describe one more experiment, and then I would love to continue this conversation about the utility. And it was probably these kinds of exper- or this discussions in the lab where they realized that DTPA was outperforming BSA as a preservation addition, that they did another very bold experiment where they said, okay, we've shown this works in a test tube. Let's put it in another bacterium and ask this, is it not only necessary, but sufficient? So they took an E. coli strain that has been well characterized as a probiotic. It's the E. coli Nissel strain. And one of the um, challenges in the the, um, probiotic industry is that the shelf life of probiotics is not great. And so you don't really Mm -hmm. know what you're ending up with by the time you take it. So they ask, what if we put um, this DTPA into our E. coli Nissel strain? So they can do that through simple genetics. They also had a control strain. They um, cultured these um, E. coli Nissel with and without DTPA, the hydrophilin, and then they desiccated the strains for a week and then put them in the um, GI tract of um, a mouse by uh, what we call oral gavage. And then they um, collected feces uh, from the animals um, days later. And what they found is that the um, E. coli Nissel strain that had been engineered to express this hydrophilin from Bamani was much more prevalent, or much more common in the um, feces. So it had survived mm-hmm. the passage through the animal and also um, in the feces itself uh, much better. So that was their crowning experiment. But then in their discussion, they really um, think deeply about the implications of this work. So if we go back to the risk that um, acetobacillus, I don't know why I have such trouble with that, Abamani um, is causing in our hospitals, um, now that we understand um, the mechanism, at least a couple of components that contribute to this um, amazing resilience to desiccation, uh, they can begin to think about ways to interrupt that or interrupt the expression of those proteins. Not only that, but as Michael was pointing out, um, they found that DTPA and presumably DTP also can just be added to biologics that you want to preserve. So not only restriction enzymes for us scientists, but also vaccine or other Mm. biologic uh, therapeutics. So um, we think, and we've probably, a number of people have probably um, read about some of the challenges with our current um, vaccines, our mRNA vaccines, and their, uh, the fact that you've got to keep them, you know, cold storage is important. So this is a challenge then distributing them to um, populations worldwide. But now if, if we have a, an amazing um, hydrophilin that can preserve biologics, proteins, RNA vaccines, um, it, it, could make a huge difference in our drug delivery systems. What do you all think? I think you're onto something, Michelle. I think well, and, and anytime, the authors are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, but they pointed I think, out in their discussion. I think it it really helps people think about how to short circuit the the cold chain because if you can just simply add a molecule that's relatively easy to synthesize because we can clone it. Um, Mm -hmm. and you can make it and it's relatively stable, Uh, I see no reason why not to do the experiment to see whether or not could preserve some of these vaccines a little bit better than, you know, keeping them at minus 80 for a prolonged period of time, especially as we're going to need to vaccinate the entire planet with, you know, pick your favorite vaccine. Uh, You know, there are always issues of the cold chain. I just wonder whether... I don't know how much of this protein you would need, for example, if you need nanogram, microgram, milligram amounts, and it's going to be immunogenic when it's injected mm. into the person with the vaccine, and if that's going to be an issue or not. So, yeah, if well, you that'll don't be need a benefit a lot, or a, a risk. <laughs> well, I don't know. So, you're going to make antibodies to DTP protein, right? Um, the question is whether they will react with anything in you, right? That's the concern, mm-hmm. I think. And that yeah, just has to be sure. looked at in animals. Uh, if we're lucky, it's okay. And maybe you don't need very yeah. much of the protein. and uh, Or maybe you can modify it if it's an issue. So uh, it's certainly worth looking into. 
because people are looking at other ways to eliminate the cold chain. And one of them is, you know, freeze drying vaccines with various sugars. Trehalose, for example, really mm. extends the uh, infectivity at, at room temperatures. So it's an area of interest. And this could be a competitor. Who knows? Yeah. 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 The authors also um, urge their colleagues to continue to study the pathogenesis of organisms, yes, but also appreciate that transmission is a key part of any um, Mm -hmm. infection, especially one that causes outbreaks like this. So they're urging others to use these methods to join them in studying tolerance to desiccation that's important not only for Bomani spread, but, but other pathogens as well. So I um, I really applaud this group, and I'd love to hear more about it. One of the things um, we do when we're cleaning the hospitals is we often use uh, a very dry approach to cleaning surfaces in the hospitals. We spray on uh, quaternary ammonia compounds that just reside on the surface for a short period of time before they evaporate. So I'm wondering whether or not we should use good old soap and water and make the environments a little wetter to effectively Mm. liberate the debris rather than relying on a a solvent, uh, an alcohol-based solvent that results in desiccation that is likely driving the selection of these systems that we're seeing in microbes like uh, Acinetobacter, as well as, you know, good old Staph aureus can live up to a year on a hospital surface. I'd also like to bring up that the first author, Erin Green, has been in microbiology for most of her career. She started as an undergraduate student at the University of Pittsburgh, Hmm. where she was absolutely fascinated by biology and molecular biology courses that she took. And she ended up doing a research stint as an undergraduate working in the lab of Tony Darville, studying the obligate intracellular pathogen chlamydia trachomatis, uh, which sparked her interest in both the fields of bacterial pathogenesis as well as genetics. She then went on to the molecular micro program at Iliozo department at Tufts. And she studied there with Joan working on Yersinia tuberculosis pseudotuberculosis, where she uh, used the TN-seq system that was just hot off the press to begin to study Yersinia infections. And she brought that technology with her, as well as some of her bioinformatic capabilities, which we really haven't touched upon. But I think Erin, in her note to Michelle, gave us the title for today's episode, A Day at the Computer can save a week at the bench, (laughs) which turned out to be very true for the multiple times throughout Aaron's uh, work here that we've talked about today. And I think even in the paper that Vincent discussed, bioinformatics um, and, you know, a a day at the computer can save a week at the bench certainly was the case with that paper as well. So, yeah, I'm imagining like when they first when they first found DTPA and then probed other genomes and found that, that yes, they're very common in the Bomani, yes. but not in other microbes. Like, wow, how cool is that? Yeah. And she's currently got several follow-up projects on how in, on the mechanism, how the lawn protease impacts desiccation, resistance, and TTPA mm. expression. So I, I think this young lady is going to go far. This was a really exciting paper, and, you know, it's got tremendous possibilities. Yeah, and and something they pointed out in the discussion, too, is their triple mutant that lacked LON and DTPA and DTPB still retained some resilience to desiccation. And Mm -hmm. so there are probably other things in the genome, much like the tardigrades have, like, a bunch of these. So lots lots to do. They've broken new ground. Bacteria that are not so resistant— to desiccation, do you think their environment just doesn't require it? I, I would say that's the selection pressure for not them for for them not acquiring this knowledge. But Niesel, where does Niesel come from? E. coli Niesel. It's a gut thing, right? Why wouldn't you it's, have? I guess you don't need desiccation resistance there. There's plenty of uh, moisture. There's right? plenty of moisture. Hmm. So, Acinetobacter is environmental as well. 
It's an environmental microbe that actually loves plastic. And plastic is a very hydrophobic molecule. So it's really adapted to grow on these hydrophobic surfaces. And in fact, that's often where we see acinetobacter infections. Typically, when someone is intubated, it grows on the tube. And it Mm. literally loves that plastic surface to colonize onto Mm. and lay down its biofilm. A pathogen of modern technology, huh? Yes. Yeah. Isn't that the one where the guy got phage therapy that saved his life? It is indeed. A, a, a Bomani, right? Yep. Very and, cool. <laughs> and and there's another Acinetobacter out there called Acinetobacter radiodurans yeah. that is actually showing up in bone and joint infections that no one understands how Oof. a microbe that was originally isolated from a spent fuel radioactive tank is now showing up in the prosthetic joint infection. So it may be an issue, a speciation, or it may be teaching us something about how to resist high levels of radiation as well. Wow. Hmm. Fascinating stuff. Could be a lot of potential yeah. here. That's great. I really I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Michelle. And and the paper too was so beautifully written. They they spelled out the logic, how they did it, why they did it. It was so easy to follow. So hats off to the authors. All right. I have two quick uh, emails to to read to you. One is from Catherine who writes, recently you discussed the possible role of using microbes to degrade plastic waste. Many months ago, you discussed electrifying microbial fuel cells. Could microbes degrade plastic and then transfer the energy to microbial fuel cells? I see I, no reason why not. I don't yeah. see why not. Yeah. As as Get on it, Catherine. Right? All right. Brian writes, thank you so much for generosity and sharing science about the apple microbiome. Two decades ago, I started a co-op in Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa, making palm wine brandy. It ended in civil war, but I learned much more than I need to know about distilled spirits. The most interesting is Calvados, the French distillate of apples. In the U.S., we make cider, and now some make apple brandy from single varieties of apples. Gravenstein, for example. Calvados, which comes from the Normandy district in France, is made from about 100 different varietals grown on the same properties. Only Hmm. 10 or 20% are sweet apples. Most are bitter or sour, which are very different. Calvados, like all unadulterated distillates, has no residual sugar. All you get is the essence of apples. So its makers aim to provide a breath of possible flavors. There's remarkably little research that I could find on the Calvados apple orchard microecosystem. Possibly Mm. it evolved by planting seeds, since apple trees do not grow true, but express different ancestral traits. I doubt that you can purchase hundreds of different sour and bitter apple stock. On microbiomes, the Abdel Fattah et al. survey found country effect explained more fungal and bacterial variants than orchard level. For a single apple variety, varietal gala. That's a paper we did a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. There was a subcontinental effect with European, New World, and Eastern Mediterranean areas showing different microbiome clusters. Something similar has been shown in both maize and citrus rhizophores, where geographical location had a greater microbiome impact than genotype variation. But these studies examine monocrops. A logical experiment would be to examine situations with many varieties together. Someone should examine Calvados apple orchards. There's no other agricultural situation I know of where hundreds of different varieties of a single lineage grow together. I didn't know that. I didn't either. I mean, I know what Calvados is. It's delightful, but... Yeah. It was David Baltimore's favorite after-dinner drink. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Who knew? (laughs) So I, I, of course, had never tasted it, so I tasted it and I liked it. Do microbiomes of Calphidos orchards have a similar variation level as single variety orchards? If not, does whatever difference they exhibit inform of the impact of monocrops on microbiomes? It's possible that abandoned old apple orchards in northeastern North America have second or third generation trees, which expressed many different varieties by accident. These could be analyzed to examine the relative weight of geographic difference. Uh, I'm no longer in academia and was never a fruit guy, but wish I could do something like this. Also, those old orchards might make some pretty good cider. There's still a a little, there's a little still in my garage waiting to find (laughs) a new world Calvados. So send your apples to Brian. Keep up the good work, (laughs) Brian. That's lovely, Brian. Thank you so much 
for uh, – I, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know Calvados was made with so many kinds of apples. Uh, and, yeah, he's right. These these microbiomes should be looked at, right? They should. Yeah, because that's the story with wine, right? The, the yeast on the wine – or on the grapes make a huge difference in the yeah. uh, flavors and the process. And that's why they're so – trying to figure out, you know, the the right yeast mix to yeah, put sure. into wines to get it to reproduce year after year. So that you mm-hmm. don't depend so much on the weather, right? On the weather and the natural yeast that come with the grapes when you do the initial yeah. crutch. You just yeah. overwhelm it with the inoculum that you've created. And no one's got that yet, right, as far as I no. know? No, there, they, there are some folks who think they do, but yeah. – <laughs> You know, th- yep. that's why you have four hundred dollar bottle of wines versus you know two buck chuck. So I think it's now three <laughs> bucks. It probably is three buck chuck, now. <laughs> or maybe five dollar chuck. All right, that is everything this, has gone up. That is the world of microbiology. It's amazing, and this is Twim number two sixty five. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twim and you can send us questions and comments. Lovely emails like Brian's. We're, we love to read them. Twim at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Your contributions are US federal tax deductible. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Michelle. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.